Blessed be God, most holy, gracious, and undivided Trinity. Blessed be God's reign, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts as the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God be with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, make us have perpetual love and reverence for your holy name, for you never fail to help and govern those whom you have set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. The first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 65. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and offering incense on bricks, who sit inside tombs and spend the nights in secret places, who eat swine's flesh with broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, Keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. See, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their laps their iniquities and their ancestors' iniquities together, says the Lord. Because they offered incense on the mountains, and reviled me on the hills, I will measure into their laps full payment for their actions. Thus says the Lord, as wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. So I will do for my ser servant's sake, and will not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob, and from Judah inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it, and my servants shall live there. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The psalm appointed for this morning is Psalm 22, verses 18 through 27. We will read it responding at the asterisk. Be not far away, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. Save me from the sword. My life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. My wretched body from the horns of wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nation shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules rules over the nations. The second reading is from Galatians chapter three. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offsprings, heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples, oops, sorry. Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As Jesus stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time, he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles but he would break the bonds and he would be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. 
They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man with whom the demons had gone sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man whom the demons had gone, from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home. Declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I'm laughing because uh, you, you saw my microphone fall apart, right? And uh, that's because I'm morally certain that's because back in the sacristy right before the service, I said, I just ordered myself a new one that goes over both ears and around the back because this thing's so stinking unstable. Well, it heard me. <laughs> and it's thinking, oh, really? You think you're going to wait till July when that thing's due in? I'm leaving now. Anyway, so what are you afraid of? Please forgive me for asking such a personal question in warm-up time, but it is the question that our gospel has had me asking all week long. Before we go there, though, I could spend this entire sermon talking about all the weird stuff in this story, and not to mention all the hidden clues the little hints and messages that are embedded in our gospel for those who were the first to hear or read it, the, those that Luke intended to be the hearers of it. But it is a wild story, I gotta admit. We have a naked, screaming man living in the town cemetery, an overly talkative demon, or, or should I say demons, an instant healing, a whole herd of apparently suicidal pigs, an entire town so terrified by this event that they asked Jesus to leave them the heck alone. What do you do with that? As always, when we read scripture, though, we start with the context. What meaning could this have had for that first audience, the audience Luke had in mind when he wrote about 50 years after this happened? That's where those clues, those hidden messages I mentioned come in. Okay, so naked screaming man living in a cemetery, probably what we today would classify as mentally ill. Demon possession has been used for millennia by many cultures and religions to explain what we now understand to be mental illness. A little tidbit, though, about that cemetery, that something that those first hearers of Luke would have caught, right smack dab in between when Jesus, when this happened in Jesus' time and the writing of the gospel when Luke wrote it, there was a huge war in the entire region. Historians referred to this as the first Jewish-Roman war. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, during this war, Roman soldiers descended on this very region we're talking about, the country of the Gerasenes. 
the, the way Luke says it. And they slaughtered a thousand young men. So by setting the story in a cemetery in this region, Luke is intimating that this possessed man has been living there where these dead young men would later die and be buried, and Luke is reminding his readers of the iron fist of Rome. And let's talk about these demons, shall we, who are so willing to give their name, legion. For most of us, that word simply means lots and lots, right? But for the first hearers of the gospel, it was very clearly tied to the Roman military division of a few thousand people. Uh, they, the sources vary between 5,000 and 6,000, but it's a lot of folks who are, make up a legion in the Roman military. So there's another place where the Roman Empire is brought to the intention of the listeners. And now, what about those poor pigs here they are just minding their own business, munching and grunting away, when suddenly they are filled with demons and the overwhelming desire to drown themselves. Two little things to note here. First of all, remember that pigs were considered unclean in the Jewish culture. So this is just a little reminder that Jesus had entered Gentile territory. And not to belabor the whole Roman military point, but Luke seems to, so I'm going to too. The very legion of soldiers that took back this area during the first Jewish uh, Roman war had, as one of their symbols on their banners, a pig. Yet another little sign to those hearing. And our terrified townspeople, oh, that is where I think our entry point is, the point where we get to be part of the story, the place where we can ask what scared them so much, and is it maybe, just maybe, the same sort of thing that scares us today? Let's look at our story. Here's a town that has been dealing with a very sick man for a very long time. They have figured out how to manage this problem. They have figured out how to exert some control over it by putting him out there in the wild. Sometimes when his howling intrudes too much on their lives, they catch him and chain him up. No doubt with the justification of keeping him safe. But let's get real. That sort of thing is way more often not about keeping the community, or not about keeping the person safe, but keeping the community safe. Let's just look at the history of the treatment of mental illness in this country. Didn't we used to do the exact same thing? We'd lock people away in sanitariums to keep them safe, when really, they just scared us. And they still scare us. I mean, we're still trying to figure out how to have control, how to keep ourselves and our children safe, from mentally ill people because they're the ones that we blame from everything from houselessness to mass shootings. Something has to be done is the cry and conveniently many of us seem to think that the problems we face are not so much about the economy or violence but about those people with mental illness. So why didn't the town people embrace Jesus? Why didn't they throw him a ticker tape parade when they came back and found this formerly ill man, completely healed, dressed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, which, by the way, I can't help but mention is another little clue, because that is the position that a disciple takes. Instead of singing Jesus' praises, they boot Jesus out. What's up with that? Now, some scholars will tell you that this is the story of Jesus' foray into the Gentile territory, and the rejection he experiences is the reason he doesn't go back. But rejection never really seemed to phase Jesus much, did it? It might even have been, though, part of Peter's initial reluctance to allow Gentiles to receive the message of salvation. For our purposes today, though, I think it's far more interesting to dig into what scared those town people so much. So much that they would reject the person 
who was being followed all over the place and healing wherever he went. They were afraid of Jesus, whom they had just seen cure this raving man whom they considered possessed. They were not amazed or delighted or thankful or even bewildered. Or maybe they were all of those things, but what drowned out all of that was this overarching fear that they had. And I think it tells us a lot about how human beings initially react to the idea of, of a God who is interested in us and why so many are reluctant to get involved with God. We are afraid. We're afraid that God will hurt us, or, or maybe even worse yet, that God will ask or want or require something of us, something that we don't want to give or we don't want to give up. I think all of this might just go back to that question, that first question that Jesus asks in the passage. What is your name? Well, now, there's an interesting question, especially in light of Scripture. Time after time, naming of something is a key to power and authority. In Genesis, God brought each animal to Adam for a name, a sign of human domination. Abram and Sarai received the new names of Abraham and Sarah from God when they were named ancestors of the people of God. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and Simon's name was changed to Peter, and the list goes on. In the deeper meaning here, what is your name really translates to whose are you? Naming brings power. If you don't believe that, have a chat with someone with a drug or alcohol addiction problem once in a while. Often, it's at that point in which the person can name the thing that is destroying their life, the point at which they can say, I am an addict. It's at that point that they began to get just a teeny foothold of power over that addiction. I remember a child I once knew who will remain nameless for monetary reasons. You know who I'm talking about here. She suffered terrible nightmares through a period of time in her, her, when she was very little. She would wake up screaming and crying almost inconsolably. I would ask, tell me, tell me about your dream. But she would refuse. Night after night, she was too afraid to even say the words. Finally, one particularly bad night, she whispered her answer to me. She told me about the bad dream. And then she said it again in a little stronger voice. And then again. And then she went back to sleep. And that was the end of the nightmares. This power has even been borne out in my personal experiences with cancer. People are terrified of getting cancer. The the word is often whispered or maybe just swiped at with phrases like the big C. But you cannot fight what you do not know. It was when it was named in my body that I got ticked off and revved up. I particularly remember the second time when the doctor called to tell me the news. She hemmed and she hawed and she apologized over and over because she had assured me at the biopsy that Cancer was not even on the table as a possibility. I said back to her, listen, I just need to know what I'm fighting. Say the words so I can get on with the battle. But naming our fears is terrifying and upsetting. You can often see that manifested in other emotional responses. For example, often people who are afraid act out in anger. Think about the mother who pulls her three-year-old back who jumps out into the street, right? She barks out, I'm so mad at you, I never want to see you do that again. But what was her first real emotion there, her first real response? Yeah, fear. 
She was afraid she would lose that child. But beware, those of you helpers out there, trying to help someone name the thing that they are afraid of can, at first, result in even bigger anger. They don't want to admit that they're afraid. They, they might be seen as weak if they do. And, and anger isn't the only reaction. Sometimes it's sadness or tears or just the immediate shutting down of the conversation. The bigger the reaction, often, the bigger the fear. Even fear big enough to turn their backs on the healing offered by Jesus. Oh, my friends, let's not do that. Let's be brave and name our fears. Let's name our own personal fears and let's get together as a community and name the fears that we have right here at St. James. Let's name them to one another if we can, even if we have to start out in a whisper. Let's name them that, so that we can start to get a foothold of power over them. Let's tell that name openly and strongly to Jesus and ask them to drive them from us, even if they are legion. Amen. Going to have to give me a second for the tech change here. Please stand and let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us, by prayer and intercession with thanksgiving, make our requests to God. Gracious God, we pray for peace, justice, and reconciliation throughout the world. We pray for the honoring of human rights, for the relief from violence, and for freedom for the oppressed. We give thanks for all that is gracious in the lives of all people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the renewal of the church in faith, love, and service. We pray for Diana, our bishop, and for the life of St. James Parish. We give thanks for the gift of your word, the grace of the sacraments, and the fellowship of your people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Lord. our prayer. We pray for our local communities and for all people in their daily life and work. We pray for the young and the elderly, for families and all who are alone. We give thanks for human skill and creativity, for the earth and its wonders, and all that reveals your creation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for those who are in need, for the sick, sorrowful, and bereaved. We pray for all who bring comfort, care, and healing, 
especially to those on our parish prayer list. Marjorie G., Nicole H., Addie C., Genevieve F., Carolyn, Lydia and their parents, Shannon, Kevin, Linda B., Tom M., and the people of Ukraine. And now, and those we now name silently or aloud. We also pray for St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Vestavia, Alabama. Pardon my pronunciation if I didn't get it quite right. Um, we also um, give thanks, um, let's see, today in thanksgiving for the emancipation of American slaves and that we may continue to work for freedom for all. We give thanks for love and friendship and for all that enriches our daily lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the fathers in our lives, both living and dead. We ask for wisdom and humility in the face of the task of parenting. Give fathers the strength to do well by their children and by you. We recognize that parenthood does not come with a manual, and reality teaches us that some fathers excel while others fall short. We ask for your blessings for them all and forgiveness and healing where it is needed. We give thanks, we, sorry, we give thanks for all, whether they have had children or not, who have helped fill the void when fathers are absent. Grandfathers and uncles, brothers and cousins, teachers, pastors, and coaches. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for those who have died Conqueror of death, remember those whom we love but see no longer, especially those we name now silently or aloud. John, Bill. We give thanks for the gift of their lives. Help us to live this day in the sure and certain hope of your eternal victory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Let us commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. To, to you, you, O Lord, Lord our God, almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Um, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, but by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Share it around. Peace. Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to God.
God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. From the primal elements you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again you call us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore we praise you, joining the heavenly chorus with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in this unending hymn. And so, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and spirit now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our ancestors, God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob, Leah, and Rachel, God and Father of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Open our eyes to see your hand in the work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Please stand as you are able. And let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Savior, amen. All right, sit back down again. I know it's not always the best way, but it's our way, so we're doing it. Oh, thank you. Um, all right, so do we have any birthdays that, or Thanksgivings or anniversaries or anything else to celebrate? Well, there is one in our bulletin, and so um, we'll say a prayer for Linda Brenniger. If you would turn to page 16 and pray with me. Watch over your child, O Lord, as her days increase. Bless and guide her wherever she may be. Strengthen her when she stands. Comfort her when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise her up if she falls. And in her heart, may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we also have uh, our graduates. We didn't have very many graduates this year turned in, but we're praying for them anyway. So we're praying for Sarah, Alexa, Leilani, and of course the children of Tualatin Valley Play School. They had their graduation here, and it was adorable. So um, if you would pray with me the prayer for the graduates. Gracious and loving God, we ask for your almighty hand to be upon our graduates. May they find comfort from the continued embrace and support of their families and friends. Bless their lives from this day on with goodness and success. Enable them to stay true to their dreams, to discern what is right, good, and just, and to use their gifts wisely and in service to others and to your glory. Empower them to walk into the future with faith, hope, and great love, guided by your light. We pray all this through Jesus Christ, our Savior, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Uh, we're having coffee hour on the porch. We're having coffee hour online. So stop in and say hello in one of those ways. Um, there was something else I was supposed to say. Well, I guess I'll have to write you a note about it because <laughs> it's gone out of my head right now. And I thought, I don't need to write that down. I'll remember. Isn't that silly? So there you got it. I'm not going to remember what it was. Uh, if you will turn to page 15 and stand, I will leave you with this blessing. God who made you loves you. God who redeemed you loves you. The God who sanctifies you loves you. And may the blessing of the God who loves you, the one holy and undivided Trinity, be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Our closing hymn is, I call this the Yeehaw Song. Do you, do you hear that when you do, you do that? In Christ there is no east or west. Trust me, you're going to want to go yeehaw at some point in this song. And you're welcome to do so.
<laughs> Go in peace to love and serve Jesus Christ, our Savior. Yeehaw! Let me hear it. Thanks be to God. Yeehaw!